Darren here with Learn Film Photography. Everything that we hear about Kodak says that they are failing. But what's the truth? Kodak is a publicly traded company, which means they have to put out an annual report for shareholders that goes into the microscopic detail about the company's assets and their liabilities that may affect the stock price in the coming year. As film photographers, we gotta know if the technology and cameras that we are spending thousands of dollars on are gonna do more than just become paperweights in the next couple of years. Because if Kodak fails, it's not just Kodak. It's also Lomography, Cinestill, Film Photography Project, Santa Color, and maybe even Fuji, which is putting out film with a new Made in the USA label on it. In 2023, it's safe to say that Kodak is the only manufacturer of color film. Now, there is some potential out there for Orwo and a few other indie manufacturers to make it big with color film, but the remaining manufacturers only create black and white. And that's because color film is so complicated that the technology takes a company with 100 years of experience and deep pockets in order to create, especially in 2023. So Kodak used to be one of the biggest, most profitable companies in the world. They once employed up to 120,000 people worldwide, and they were traded on the S&P 500 index fund since the fund's inception in 1957. People who have never shot Kodak film know the brand from the iconic bright yellow logo and viral ad campaigns like the Kodak Moment. But Kodak stopped making money in the 2000s with the rise of digital photography, and they went bankrupt in 2012 after losing billions of dollars. That caused them to have to restructure the entire business just to keep the lights on. Kodak sold its digital kiosk, camera, film chemical, paper production, framing, and film sales divisions to the UK Kodak Pension Plan to resolve a $2.8 billion claim against the company. That sale split the company into two distinct entities, Kodak Alaris and Eastman Kodak. In this video, we're talking about Eastman Kodak, which is the company that makes film in Rochester, New York, along with various other ventures. Kodak Alaris, on the other hand, makes money by purchasing the film from Eastman Kodak and then marking it up and distributing it across the world. They're the sole distributor of Kodak film. In this report, Kodak announces everything from how much money they made by raising film prices to how much debt they still have and how much money they expect to lose fighting lawsuits in both New York and Brazil. So will Kodak be able to continue running as a profitable company? And how close are they really to shutting down for good? Is Kodak okay? Now, before I get into all that, I have to tell you about today's sponsor, which is Softgrain Books. Softgrain is a lens-based fine art photo book publisher co-founded by myself and another international artist. And together, we are on a mission to promote long-form, narrative, journalistic, and fine art photography. When you purchase a book from Softgrain Books, you are supporting small, independent photo book publishing, as well as the artists who make this all possible. And if you are among the first 100 people to sign up for the email list, you will get a lifetime 10% discount code for all purchases now and forever. Use the link in the description below to check out Softgrain Books and support independent art. And as a side note, we are also accepting submissions right now for new projects. So check out the link below, submit your photos. I would love to help you turn them into photo books. All right, so let's get started. In 2022, Kodak made 1.205 billion USD, and they made that money in four distinct categories, traditional printing, digital printing, advanced materials and chemicals, branding, and then a the little bit extra from some non-reportable sectors. Traditional printing makes up the bulk of Kodak sales at just under 60% of the total business. Traditional printing includes selling printers, inks, Sonora process-free plates, which are a big deal for Kodak, packaging, and other materials for consumer and professional printing presses. The remaining slices of the pie are $227 million from digital printing, $17 million from selling their brand name, and $16 million from other. Film production falls in the Advanced Materials and Chemicals division, which is the most forward-thinking division in Kodak's entire portfolio. In 2022, Advanced Materials and Chemicals made just $234 million, or 20% of Kodak's total revenue. Consumer and cinema film production accounted for just 75 million or a grand total of 6% of Eastman Kodak's revenue last year, with a $15 million increase in those profits directly attributed to improved pricing. We want more money. 
If that number feels low, here's why. Eastman Kodak only creates the film. After Eastman Kodak finishes a production run, they sell it to Kodak Alaris, which has been owned by the Pension Protection Fund in the UK since 2020. Kodak Alaris generated $30 million in revenue from film sales in their financial period that ended in March 2022. And that's on top of their sales from the Kodak Moments brand that sells prints at kiosks and stores, as well as online. The timing of the annual report is a little ways off, so it's hard to get a complete picture of the total revenue from selling Kodak Film in 2022. And to add further complexity, Kodak Alaris is technically a privately owned company, meaning they're technically not obligated to give their shareholders their entire financial picture the way that Eastman Kodak is. But we may still see another annual report published in fall 2023 that details how much money they made from the remainder of the 2022 year. Despite what many reports would have you believe, Kodak's business comes from a surprisingly broad range of industries. Kodak creates products like light blocking fibers, unregulated key starter materials or KSMs for pharmaceutical companies, as well as materials to print circuit boards and build batteries. They also produce inkjet printers, software for printing companies, as well as large scale press printers and packaging machines for books, magazines, and newspaper publishers. Over its 130 years in the business, Kodak has developed a staggering 79,000 patents, which it uses to protect its IP and to generate revenue. But where things start to get complicated are the costs of doing business. If you've heard Kodak is hanging on by a thread, kind of is. To make that 1.205 billion in revenue in 2022, Kodak had to spend 1.035 billion. That includes everything from taxes to 134 million in wages for the over 4,200 employees, construction costs, licensing, raw materials, environmental obligations, court cases, and a lot more. So what Kodak actually ends up bringing home after all the dust settled is just $26 million. That means Kodak's profit margin is 2.2%, which is lower than your average restaurant. Heck, even bad restaurants and cafes are bringing home a higher profit margin than Kodak is right now. And this is during the height of the film resurgence when Leica, Pentax, and Mint are developing new film cameras. So when drilling deep into this report, Kodak noted that after all costs were considered, the Advanced Materials and Chemicals Division actually lost $1 million in 2022, which is up from a $6 million loss in 2021. Kodak benefited from increased prices and higher volumes of motion picture film, but they lost money from increased manufacturing costs and investments in the sector. The most profitable ventures for the company after accounting for costs were selling their brand name for $16 million, traditional printing, which is the printing presses and packaging division, that pulled in over $27 million. And there was a whopping $98 million in extra income generated by Eastman Kodak's multi-billion dollar pension fund. This means in 2022, Kodak actually made more money operating as a hedge fund than it did from any other segment of its physical business. And just for comparison, Kodak's peak revenue was $16 billion in 1996, which translates to over $31 billion today when accounting for inflation. Consumer photography started to hit its peak in the 90s as electronic cameras made photography faster, easier, and cheaper than ever before. Developing kiosks were more common than Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts combined. Kodak was pretty much the only game in town and everybody was playing. Kodak today makes less than 8% of what it did during its 1996 peak. So let's get into why Kodak is doing profit margins that are barely better than a gas station. Accepting that you've peaked is very free. When Kodak went bankrupt in 2012, it was forced to take on a massive $895 million restructuring loan, which forced them to sell manufacturing of photochemicals, light-sensitive Kodak paper, cameras, frames, and the online photo service businesses. These were basically all the processes that were already being handled overseas. So Kodak held on to the most specialized services that they could only do in Rochester, New York, like producing film, coatings, and other materials that couldn't be done without 100 years of experience, talent, and large factories. They scrapped most of their plants, they laid off most of their staff, and they threw away generations of knowledge and machinery that are simply not replaceable on a $26 million budget in 2023. In 2020, Kodak Alaris was transferred to the UK's Pension Protection Fund, which took over the UK defined pension payments. And then the Pension Protection Plan broke apart Kodak Alaris, selling the photochemical, paper, and display division to their Chinese distributor, Sinopromise. 
If you'd been developing film at home before 2020, then you likely saw the new packaging wreak havoc on the longevity of Kodak film chemicals during the pandemic. Many film photographers around the world reported getting blank rolls due to developer that had exhausted before the dry contents were mixed, which is something that has never happened before. This is because Sinopromise tried using different packaging for their dry chemicals, and this has reduced some of the trust that a lot of film photographers had in Kodak over the years. Now the Pension Protection Fund plans to sell the remaining parts of Kodak Alaris starting in 2023, which might mean more price hikes coming in the future. So all the Kodak Alaris was to benefit the UK pensioners, but American pensioners had a bit of a different history here. Over the company's 130 year history, Kodak built up an investment portfolio for their US based pension fund with a combined fair value worth $4.2 billion in 2022. This is made up of real estate, private equity, hedge funds. Through these investments, the fund produces enough profit to pay the expected pension rate. In 2023, Kodak expects to pay 333 million in international national pension benefits, with that amount decreasing by approximately 10% each year thereafter. So after all was said and done, the pension plan had an extra $98 million in revenue that was transferred back to Eastman Kodak in 2022, which is safe to say is what kept the company in the black. That said, the pension fund is not actually controlled by Kodak, and it's not an asset on the company's balance sheet. The pension fund is a separate entity that has a fiduciary duty to the pension holders and sometimes has a little extra profit that gets put back into Kodak's piggy bank. It's not like Kodak can just dip into the pension fund whenever they want for pizza parties or whatever multi-billion dollar multinationals do with their money. In terms of debt, Kodak owes $225 million from a loan they took out in 2021, which was likely a renegotiation of the original $895 million restructuring debt. This loan incurs a staggering 12.5% per annum and is going to mature into a $366 million loan that is payable in 2026. And until that maturity date, Kodak is just paying off the interest along with a small amount of the principal or fees amounting to $40 million in 2022. For the duration of the loan, Kodak must also maintain a minimum unrestricted liquidity, also known as cash on hand, of $80 million, or they risk having the bank call in the loan premium maturely. It's safe to say if that happened, it would mean a fire sale of company assets. Now, this wouldn't normally be cause for concern, but with Kodak right now, they have seen significant liquidity drawdown since 2021. In 2021, they had a healthy, unrestricted $250 million in cash, giving them some breathing room. But in 2022, they drew that fund down to just $150 million in the US, which leaves very little room for error. On a scale like Kodak's, it does not take much to spend $70 million. The company already burns roughly $3 million in a single day. When accounting for the large drawdown of unrestricted cash, Kodak blamed it on the same usual messages that we've heard time and time again and have not changed over the last three years. Here's what they said. Kodak is experiencing negative cash flows due to supply chain disruptions, shortages in materials and labor, increased labor, commodity and distribution costs, and slowdown in customer demand relating to the global economic conditions. The economic uncertainty surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the current inflationary environment, and other global events represents an additional element of complexity in Kodak's plans to return to sustainable, positive cash flow. Now, of course, that's not the only cause for concern, because Kodak is also going to court in multiple countries. This includes a tax and labor dispute in Brazil and multiple insider trading lawsuits taking place in New York right now. For the Brazilian case, there isn't much information available online. You can't find it with a Google search even when searching in Portuguese, but there is a small mention of it in the annual report. Kodak states that this single lawsuit could cost Kodak up to $116 million, which if that went through tomorrow would bring Kodak's liquidity $46 million under that 80 million threshold. Of course, the maximum lawsuit amount is always an over the top number. So Kodak notes in their report that even though they intend to defend their position vigorously, they expect to lose $6 million in the case. Now, the New York lawsuits all stem around the 2020 announcement that Kodak would receive a $765 million loan from the United States government to follow Fuji's lead and invest in the manufacturing of generic drugs. Though the deal ultimately fell through shortly after the government started investigating alleged insider trading by Kodak executives when the deal was announced. 
A class action lawsuit on behalf of the shareholders was also filed shortly after the government reneged on the announcement. Though that lawsuit was ultimately dismissed with prejudice on September 28, 2022, meaning that it cannot be reopened. So Kodak escaped the class action lawsuit, but they're far from out of the water. Kodak, along with some former and current directors, are defending themselves in both federal and state courts for breaching Section 10B of the Exchange Act for allegedly breaching fiduciary duty and unjust enrichment resulting from stock trades, options grants, and charitable contribution in the context of the COVID-era pharmaceutical loan announcement. Allegedly. The state court is currently pending, awaiting for a resolution in federal court before it proceeds. That court case is still active as of December 2022, and at this time, Kodak has not estimated the likelihood of loss in this proceeding. So what does this all mean for Kodak? The good and bad news is Kodak is not relying on the sale of film to keep them afloat in 2023. Over 130 years of technological advances from being one of the largest companies in the world has granted them an enormous amount of assets that they can use to keep their company afloat and that they can also use to pivot to new ventures, which we're already seeing. Kodak has a thriving business in the traditional printing sector. And on the side, they're making batteries, printing circuit boards, creating advanced materials, and investing in those key starter materials for the pharmaceutical industry. So they are pretty diverse as it is. But most people say that Kodak's biggest failure was not chasing digital photography. Because I gotta say one thing. I've been editing this video for over a month now, and. I've been reading a ton about Kodak in that time. And there's this one point that I think is really important that everyone misses. So everyone says that Kodak completely missed the digital revolution as if they buried their heads in the sand and just let the digital revolution run them over. But that couldn't be further from the truth. So Kodak actually invented the digital camera in the 1970s. And in the 90s, the company made major pivots and investments into the digital photography space. And in fact, they retrofitted Nikon and Canon cameras with digital modules that look pretty similar to what I'm Back is doing right now. If you don't know who I'm Back is, I'll link them in the comments below. It's a pretty cool project, you should check it out. So then Kodak then sold these digital cameras. They had contracts with the military, with American press, and other news organizations. So Kodak actually paved the way. They made real digital cameras that worked for professionals. It was this whole huge revolution for these photographers who were used to having to go back to the dark room and then printing their photos fast as possible without even fixing their film. Kodak started the digital revolution. They made digital photography happen, but then in the 2000s, Kodak never made professional cameras. There was a reason that they used the Canon and the Nikon ecosystems when they made these digital cameras, and that's because Kodak doesn't have any professional lenses. Kodak doesn't have any desire to make professional cameras. The problem is that Kodak's target market is the consumer market. They made cameras for everyday people who didn't want to learn camera settings, deal with ISO, or get their hands dirty with black and white developers. So they targeted the people who wanted to click a button and take a good photo, which is realistically most people. They were used to this whole, you sell the consumer a razor blade handle, and then the razor blades make up most of the money. And Kodak continued to use that market they continue to make cameras like that for the digital market, which just didn't last. So that's also why Canon, Nikon, Hasselblad, and Fuji, and other manufacturers still live on today, is because they made these major advances for the professional market that got people excited about cameras. So professionals used these cameras, which was some of the best advertising in the world. You see the professionals out there using that professional Canon glass, and you know that Canon's a good camera manufacturer, even if you're just buying a Rebel. Kodak didn't have that. Film was dying and Kodak only made the cheap cameras that just couldn't compete with the iPhone. Because at the end of the day, the people who wanted the easy photos, they are happy with their phones right now. In fact, a lot of those people believe that their phones take better photos than their Canon Rebels do, and they're not wrong because the phone just does it so quickly and easily. All right, so uh, that's just what I had to say here. Uh, let's get back to the video now. But when you look at the digital photography market in 2023, even the biggest manufacturers are struggling. Canon, Nikon, Fuji, and Sony combined are all spending billions each year chasing small advances in digital photography, hoping that new marketing will make photographers ditch last year's camera. For example, Canon made 28 billion US in 2022, which is the same amount of money that they've made year over year since the early 2000s. 
When accounting for inflation, that means Canon is making up to 50% less money in 2023 than they did during the aughts. And that's even though they are the dominant camera manufacturer in the world with a broad portfolio of industries. And after they made that 28 billion in revenue, they only made 1.7 billion after expenses, which is just a profit margin of 6%. So if Kodak followed the same strategy that worked for them in the past, they may have survived or even thrived in the early 2000s, but they would have been killed by the iPhone. Right now, Kodak is making the transitions they need to become more viable in the 20th century by transitioning to creating key starter materials for pharmaceuticals and investing in batteries and circuit printing. Kodak could be in the right place even with the $366 million loan that's coming due. Kodak's brand is also still a very valuable asset for them. So long as Kodak continues to only license its brand name to high quality products, the company will be able to rely on this income for a long time to come. The biggest hurdle Kodak faces is their risk of a sudden expense bringing their cash on hand below that $80 million threshold. Something simple like the film production lines going down, losing both court cases at once, or a sudden spike in the raw materials like silver and aluminum could cause major ripples in their finances that create lasting year-over-year -year effects on their bottom line. Kodak can't just sell their stock to make up losses like they used to because the stock has a low price and it is extremely volatile, which makes it an unattractive asset to trade. It's safe to say that Kodak is taking this problem seriously because despite earning 12% less in the first quarter of 2023 than 2022, they did top up their liquidity. But there is also a lot to look forward to in 2023. For instance, film photography is still surging. And even with the price increases, film only made Kodak $75 million of its total 1.2 billion in revenue. So film is not a big driver of Kodak's bottom line, Certainly film is a profitable venture though that provides funding for Kodak's continued research into their advanced materials and chemicals division. And the fact that Fujifilm is most likely producing their film in Kodak's factory, again there's no confirmation of this, but it is the most likely scenario, means that Kodak is going to see higher than normal revenues in 2023. And here's why I think that Fujifilm is now being made by Kodak. Fuji does have factory facilities in the USA, but they never had a film production line there. Instead, they relied on the cheap shipping across the Pacific Ocean. The fact is, in 2023, Kodak cannot make a new film production line, even if they wanted to, because it's just way too expensive. If Fuji wanted to move their production to America, they would incur hundreds of millions of dollars in costs just to move the machines or to rebuild them. And on top of that, they'd have to train new staff, pay them higher wages, and overcome new environmental regulation. But for what benefit? Better access to the American market? maybe slightly better access to raw materials, with the ease and reliability of global shipping at an all-time high, spending hundreds of millions of dollars to move their production to America just doesn't make sense and wouldn't pay off for more than 10 years. But contracting your film production to another high-end facility ensures the money keeps on flowing without having to get their hands dirty. And we can see this type of production happening with goods all over the world. For example, the Sapporo, Heineken, or Guinness you drink doesn't actually come from Japan, Holland, or Ireland. They're contract brewed in your country and potentially even in your state by the big brewers like Labatt or Anheuser-Busch. And Fuji has made statements about only supporting the photo industry because of their legacy, not because it turns a profit or because it matters to their bottom line. So even with all the advancements that Kodak has made, and the potential upside that they're seeing in 2023, Kodak is still just a shell of its former self. The market cap, or the value of all of Kodak stocks combined, is around $400 million. And that means that somebody like Ryan Reynolds could buy a controlling share of the company with just the proceeds that he made from the sale of Mint Mobile. And he could potentially even take the entire business private if he wanted to. Kodak is small. It is much smaller than it has been in the past. And to grow is going to take a long time with a big concerted effort. So do you think that Kodak is safe? Are you gonna keep buying film and film cameras in 2023 even with the price increases? Let me know down in the comments below. And thanks for watching. And if you liked this video, please hit the thumbs up icon and subscribe to see future videos like this. This video is a big departure from the usual learn film photography content. So let me know down below if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future. That's all for now. Catch you in the next one. I just wanted to put out one thing. This is not the annual report of a company that's doing super well. So if, when you look at it, the pages are yellowing, the sheets are very cheap paper, the text goes edge to edge. 
there's not a single photo to be found and there's like a ton of graphs that are hard to read with the same information but different numbers for some reason and this is not the annual report of a company that's doing well if they're doing well they're going to make this thing look amazing they're going to put full color a nice cover um they're going to have tons of stock images of happy people doing stuff with computers or whatever and they're gonna make it look nice. So the thing is, Kodak is trying to show this air of being responsible with their money, which is why they make this as cheap, but like packed full of information as possible. They want people to see that they can trust this company, um, that they're not just gonna waste money on frivolous ventures. But the thing is, Kodak actually makes the printers for these things. Kodak makes large scale printers for newspapers, for magazines, for everything, for books. And like, so they also make the paper and they make the ink. So they could make a really nice version of this for the same cost as like a Fortune 500 company would pay for this version. Um, it's This is not the look of a good news document. All right, thanks for coming for my TED Talk. I just wanted to point that out. I thought it was a nice, interesting bit of color. So, okay, we'll catch you guys in the next one.